The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. In this season of Epiphany, we are reminded that it is you, Lord Jesus, who are the light of the world. May your light open our eyes to see those in need around us. May the works of our lives demonstrate your love. And may your wisdom enlighten all that we do and all that we are. Jesus, you are the light of the world. We ask that you hear the prayers of our hearts. And as you enlighten our lives, may we be light for others. Amen. Amen. Established by the Vestry of St. Paul's in 2008, the annual Martha J. Horn Lecture honors Martha Horn, the former Dean and President of the Virginia Theological Seminary. It also recognizes and honors the long relationship that exists between this parish and the Virginia Seminary from its beginning. Martha's devotion to the training and formation of lay and ordained leaders is also something dear to our hearts as a parish and part of our identity and mission. Our lecture this morning follows this same theme, transformation in the Episcopal Church, leadership development, and beloved community in the 21st century. It is our great honor to have with us this morning Bishop Catherine Jefford Shorey, the 26th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. I do not want it to be lost on anyone here this morning that we are in the company of two women who have helped transform our beloved church. Dean Horn, the first woman dean and president of ETS, is also the first woman dean of any seminary in the Anglican Communion. Bishop Catherine, the first woman presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, also the first woman primate in the Anglican Communion. I conclude this introduction with a few lines from your book, Bishop Catherine, a wing and a prayer, a message of faith and hope. Uh, this poem was written by June Witten in 2003 on the eve of the ordination of the first women priests in the Church of England. The door is open and the women come, praising and singing, walking hand in hand. Praising and singing, we will welcome them and gather at the altars where they stand. Dean Horn and Bishop Catherine, we are blessed that you stand among us. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Catherine. Thank you. It is a joy to be here, and I am grateful for the opportunity to honor Martha and her husband and her many, many women colleagues in this church who have been a blessing to us all. I'm going to speak probably for half an hour, and then I hope we can generate some conversation before we have to go to church. Some of us have to go to church. <laughs> Christianity, and I would assert all religion, is centered on transformation. God dreams of a transformed world, a world of peace with justice, a dream that's only realizable through transformed human hearts and communities. We preach salvation through death and resurrection, continually dying to what is ungodly, and seeking rebirth in the way of Jesus. As Athanasius put it centuries ago, God became human in order that human beings might become divine. New life only happens through transformation. The church has long proclaimed that reality as ecclesia semper, semper reformanda est, the church is always reforming, always being reformed. In the last century, Karl Barth popularized that understanding as the church is always being reformed. The church and the members of the body of Christ can only keep to the way of Christ if we're willing to die and be reborn over and over and over and over again. The church exists for God's mission, moving toward that dream of a healed and just creation. Together we seek that dream in liturgy, in theology, in praxis, doing and being, living and praying, and reflecting on how that's going. 
When the body discerns a new or renewed direction and intentionally engages it, what do we find? Resistance, fear, sometimes excitement, and often impotence or incompetence. Think about making a New Year's resolution or a Lenten vow to pray every day. It's hard work. There's always tension between conserving what has seemed good or just in the past and expanding into potentially life-giving newness. That conflict or tension is part of the beginning of our story in the Garden of Eden. There's always risk in choosing the new and learning to choose wisely is key to transformed life. No choice, no growth, and no way of moving toward the reign of God. Yet choosing is never enough. Free will means we can choose, but we never manage to make only right choices. And the options rarely lead to the fullness of the will of God. We try and we fail, yet with the support of others in community, we fail a little less often. That's how and why 12-step groups work. It's why we make confession. It's why accountability in community is vital to human attempts at transformation. There's another chair here. This nation began and developed in a climate of radical transformation, asserting that human dignity required equality, freedom, and the possibility of abundant life for all people. We still struggle toward that vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people who dwell in this land. Yet a long series of legal and cultural transformations has brought us closer to that dream. We started with a system that basically only recognized white, free, land-owning men as capable of choosing the direction of this new nation. Then the franchise was extended to men who weren't landholders, who weren't taxpayers, who weren't born in the United States. Slaves were freed. Women gained the vote nearly a century ago. Children slowly began to receive rights to education and humane working conditions independent of their families' choices. LGBTQI persons are slowly being accorded equal rights and dignity. Gender equity is slowly being normalized in law and custom. And we are beginning to affirm the urgency of stewarding the non-human creation with, on which all our lives depend. None of those transformations is yet complete. Slavery, discrimination, and abuse abound. Yet the arc of the moral universe is bending toward greater justice. As a community charged to be in the world but not of it, the church has engaged transformation along with the nation and the wider world. While the church at times has led transformation toward God's justice, it has also often lagged. Church leadership is a prime example. It's been a very long time since this church first ordained African American and Native American men. Yet the ordained leadership still doesn't adequately reflect congregational mem membership. Absalom Jones was made deacon in 1795 and priest in 1802, and Magabo was made deacon in 1859 and priest in 1867. The first of those clergy were almost always limited to working in congregations that looked like them. With one bold exception in 1946, we didn't let women represent us as deputies in general convention until 1972. The Anglican Communion's status quo made it unthinkable to ordain a woman until Bishop Roland Hall had nobody else to send to his congregations in occupied Macau. 
in the Second World War. Francis Lee Tim Oi was ordained in 1944. Once the communion found out, the upset meant that she wasn't recognized again as a priest until Hong Kong, still Hong Kong, ordained two more women priests in 1971. Yet this church made some very significant changes in its colonial era, changes that still haven't come to the part, other parts of the Anglican communion. Not having a bishop here until after the revolution meant that confirmation was never celebrated. Members of the Anglican churches then decided in community when they were ready to come to communion. Today, confirmation is still required in almost all provinces of the communion before people may come to Holy Communion. The shortage of priests here meant that lay leadership was exercised in novel and essential ways. Lay clerks led daily offices and preached. Vestries governed and chose their clergy without benefit of any bishop telling them what to do. I'm serious. <laughs> Church women raised funds and formed children. And in some places, colonial governments made the ecclesiastical decisions. The church in these United States developed in circumstances in which adaptation was essential to survival. That's one kind of transformation. We've struggled with some of the other kinds of transformation. There is a necessary and vital tension between conserving the best of what we have learned over centuries what we usually call wisdom, and holding ourselves radically open to the Pentecostal reality of the movement of God's spirit within us and around us. I noted briefly that confirmation wasn't practiced here during the colonial era. But as soon as there were bishops here, Seabury and to a slightly lesser degree, White and Provost, encouraged confirmation even for those who were already admitted to Holy Communion. Two centuries later, in the 1979 revision of our prayer book, we collectively agreed that admission to communion was understood in the early church as a gift of baptism, and therefore we should practice accordingly. Confirmations not required. Now some places are wrestling with whether or not formal water baptism is still normative. The invitation is often given to anyone in the congregation to come to communion. The tension and conflict that attend transformation rarely disappear until the next challenge emerges. The bishops of this church began to wrestle open, openly with the variety of human sexual orientation and identity in the early 1960s. We certainly aren't finished with that work, and resistance will likely continue for years to come. At the same time, the recognition of the image of God in people of all genders and orientations continues to expand and the church is increasingly affirming the possibility that godly lay and clergy leaders come in the same variety in which God makes people. An example. The Episcopal Church has about 3,000 deacons. 3,000. That's a major increase from 50 years ago when there were fewer than 200. They are mostly gray-haired, and collecting social security, and more than half of them are women. That robust growth indicates how important their ministry has become. Yet only a third of them are younger than 72. Only about 20 are younger than 40. Few are formally employed by the church for pay. The vocations of deacon and priest are markedly different. 
Yet we still see priests vesting and functioning as deacons in the liturgy, even when deacons are available. Some dioceses still don't encourage or ordain deacons. We've made some progress in building distinctive formation processes for deacons, yet we still have a very long way to go. Formation programs in most places are expensive and time costly and difficult for people in earlier adult life to justify and negotiate. Think about family, career, and student loans in the context of honing gifts that are necessary for what is almost always a non-stipendiary ministry. Yet also think about the possible impact that younger deacons might have among millennials, among homeless youth, on college campuses, at the local music scene, in the pub or the pizza parlor. I increasingly believe that we might adopt aspects of what I, I first heard from a colleague in Machakos, Kenya. Bishop Kanuku told me that he looks for new leaders in congregations and then designates them as evangelists. If they gather a community for worship and service, he will license them as catechists, teachers in the congregation. The congregations who grow and organ the, the leaders who organize and grow the community will be ordained deacons, trans transitional deacons, not the kind of deacon I was speaking about earlier, usually. And if the community continues to grow and thrive, he'll find another catechist for that community and send the deacon off to Bible college. When that one graduates, he will be ordained priest, and it's almost all he in Kenya. Proven transformative leadership is blessed and put to work. The understanding of diaconal ministry in Kenya is not quite like ours, but the method bears consideration. We could identify millennial leaders with hearts for justice work, bless those gifts, and continue the necessary formation while they're serving as diaconal ministers and leaders. <coughs> the Diocese of Connecticut is doing something like that right now, sending young adults out as missionaries to discover and engage what God is already doing in the neighborhood. Consider that we baptize on the basis of God's promise in a person who will be reborn into a community of formation. That's really what our baptism means. Confirmation does the same thing. Ordained ministry is not radically different, and we've already recognized that by requiring ongoing formation for each ordained minister. We should do the same for all the baptized. The other major transformational reality in ordained leadership has a parallel with the work of deacons. That's a set of adaptive changes that reflect growing realities in the church and society, but also seek to recover the evangelical urgency of the early church. In the United States part of the Episcopal Church, the average congregation has 55 people in church on Sunday or over the weekend. You are an outlier. <laughs> a congregation with 55 people on a weekend rarely needs the ministry of a full-time priest. Today, only 58% of our priests in this church are compensated full-time for active ministry in one continuing Episcopal context. Just over half. We're seeing an increasing number of bivocational and non-stipendiary clergy, which is actually a recovery of more ancient tradition. What did Paul do? Tent maker. How did Jesus make his living before he... Carpentry, exactly. Earlier clergy in this part of the world made a living by farming or from the produce of their parishioners' fields and flocks and in some parts of the communion they still do. We're also seeing more continuing service by retired clergy, by people who serve in intermittent 
ministries and in multiple context positions. The current patterns across the U.S. part of the Episcopal Church reflect regional history and cultural differences. The northeastern part of the U.S. has an abundance of clergy who serve more than one congregation. The South, and I'm going to include this part of the world, still has a preponderance of one priest serving one parish full time. The Midwest has lots of bivocational clergy. And the West has more congregations that are served by supply clergy and clergy who are non-stipendiary or solely employed in secular work. We even have several bishops who are part-time and or bivocational. Western Kansas, we now have the second bishop there who has another position. North Dakota, Eastern Oregon, that too is a pattern much more like what was seen in the early church. We have a growing number of congregations served by Lutheran or Moravian clergy with whom we are in full communion and some Episcopal clergy serving in those traditions. The Episcopal Church beyond the United States exhibits a remarkable variety. There are very few vocational deacons there are lots of non-stipendiary and bivocational priests and priests who serve multiple congregations. The church in Europe is increasingly indigenizing with worship opportunities in the local language as well as in English and significant partnership with the old Catholics. One of the most significant challenges in this environment is about effective education and formation for all Christians. Clergy formation has been seminary focused for the last century and more and has recently become cost prohibitive for many aspirants and their dioceses. When clergy are ordained with seminary debt on top of college debt, they are increasingly unable to serve part time or in poorer communities. The emergence of a few seminaries like Virginia Theological Seminary who can support the full cost of formation will expand the church's ability to deploy effective clergy in a greater variety of contexts. Local and part-time educational programs like diocesan schools and the Iona School of the Seminary of the Southwest are also expanding those possibilities. What we're talking about is a mixed economy one solution does not work everywhere. Yet leadership in Episcopal congregations is shared between clergy and laity. And there's a growing recovery and understanding that every baptized person has gifts for ministry. Some of those gifts in the world, some in the church. Adequate and lifelong formation for all people is absolutely essential. Opportunities like education for ministry, Stephen ministry, study with ecumenical and other religious partners, try doing Bible study with the local Jewish community sometime. It's absolutely life changing. Local discipleship groups, Bishop Curry's The Way of Love, and there's a program coming for Lent. Pay it to, pay, be aware. <laughs> All of those offer a great deal toward that ability to share leadership. There's an evangelical gift for all when gifts for ministry are being exercised in daily life as well as in Sunday worship. And that understanding is changing how we think about and function in worship, education, service, pastoral care, and congregational development. And in some ways, it's a reflection and developmental consequence of the experience in the church here in the colonial era. It's a, it's a new chapter in what has always been done on these shores. We may be closing congregations in some places, but we're also opening them in creative and surprising ways responding to the yearning or brokenness of the world around us. What does that look like in this neighborhood? We keep hearing about the disconnectedness of many people from meaningful friendships or community. 
Smartphones and the internet are great, but they can also distract from face-to-face -face encounters that are necessary to building lasting relationships of vulnerability and growth. Many people are on the move without roots or support systems in the wider community. Homelessness is growing. Fewer people know their neighbors. The level of verbal violence in our culture is one result. For we don't have the necessary range of relationships across communities to sustain constructive conversation in the midst of difference. Some church plants begin with that challenge. St. Lydia's Dinner Church started in Manhattan several years ago as a gathering of young adults cooking dinner together. Over the years, it's become a worshiping community of Episcopalians, Lutherans, and others. Dinner Church happens on Sundays and Mondays. Waffle Church happens on Sunday morning once a month. <laughs> And they've developed a co-working space that includes regular spiritual grounding. They claim that their mission is to work together to dispel isolation, reconnect neighbors, and subvert the status quo. Lest that last one scare you, <laughs> note that we will never see the reign of God if we are satisfied with how things are right now. Named by the participants, the church of right here, right now in Ocean Beach <laughs> meets in the courtyard of San Diego's diocesan offices on Wednesday evenings for a service of word and communion. It was started by a deacon to serve neighbors, including the homeless. It's one element in a range of services offered to the community through the week. Meals on Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings, medical services, an address, mail distribution services three times a week, clothing, showers, connection to veterans and other social services, including housing and employment. Garden Church, formed around rotting compost. <laughs> Manure that fig tree. <laughs> And it's become worship space in the midst of vegetable gardens, recycling neighborhood food scraps to fertilize those vegetable plots, and sharing a meal together. It's also built community across economic strata of, and a vision of the reign of God once again as earthlings in the garden. St. Luke's in San Diego is a restart in a neighborhood where many Sudanese and Congolese refugees have resettled. The building's been there for many years, but the congregation had dwindled, dwindled to a dozen or so Anglos. Today, the congregation is led by a clergy couple sharing their vicar duties and a vestry that's three quarters Sudanese. They've moved their service times to permit a Nazarene congregation of college students to worship in the time between. They share their wider campus with several community service organizations, providing assistance to refugees and the homeless for job training and employment counseling. They're rehabbing their kitchen to, uh, to upgrade it to commercial use so they can train culinary workers primarily the resettled and formerly homeless. A group has planted a vegetable garden on part of the property and they distribute food weekly. It's a remarkable example of entrepreneurial leadership and what's often called asset-based community development. Community organizing is a central part of the congregation's shared ministry. St. Lydia's, St. Luke's, Garden Church are sharing the good news of God's love in concrete and intimate ways. And they're transforming communities by listening deeply to what God is up to and to what people are yearning for. It's reconciling transformation, bringing people together with what's needed for abundant life. Congregations and church planters in many places are thinking about coffee as well as food. 
Mother Elise started a coffee shop at VTS as a student <laughs> called the Flamingo. <laughs> And I think the dean followed up with the idea for the pub cafe called 1823. Hospitality is central to good news. Jesus ate and drank and made festival with all sorts and conditions of people. And growing numbers of congregations are hosting meals for the neighborhood as ways of reconciling and transforming their communities. Cathedrals, several of them at least, are remo removing pews so that they can welcome a variety of celebrations, from yoga mass to wedding dinners. Medieval cathedrals were on the city square and directly involved in the full range of the city's life. Market day, feast days, shelters for pilgrims and the lost. Part of our task is to meet Jesus where he already is, in the community around us, to discover him in strangers, to join in his reconciling work, and to celebrate the emergence and growth of beloved community. Some are turning their lawns into vegetable gardens and food forests, hosting farmers markets, sharing food with the hungry and those who live in food deserts. Jubilee Park in Dallas, Texas, offers cooking classes and nutrition education, teaching how to fix unfamiliar foods on a, bud on a budget. Others offer not only 12-step programs, but encourage fitness and health for the whole person, all while building community among people who were once strangers to each other. There's a congregation not far from here that's partnered with others to clean up and care for its local watershed. Some start preschools to provide holistic childcare and a curriculum grounded in God's love for everyone, starting with all the little children. Our partnership in God's mission yields the peace that comes with reconciliation, justice, and the healing of division and inequity. In this season, as a church, we're focused on God's mission through the way of love, and engaging with racial reconciliation, creation care, and evangelism. The good news comes in many forms. The first task is to hear the brokenness and division of the world, and then discover and discern where and how to engage it. The second part begins with awareness of the gifts we've been given, buildings, expertise, partners, and dreams. That strategic discernment is called community organizing. It's about offering the gifts present in a community into that community's brokenness and yearning. That is exactly what Jesus did in his ministry and with his life. Healing, feeding, teaching, dying, and rising. Sometimes the possibilities are surprising. The Diocese of Rochester in New York recently held its diocesan convention in a Muslim social hall, asking hospitality of another faith community and building bridges and partnerships in, a, in that process. Many of you remember the solidarity of hundreds of faithful people with the Lakota community at Standing Rock or the deep connect connections built over many, many years between the Diocese of Virginia and South Sudan, including the congregation that worships here. That kind of transformation even happens up the road in Washington, as the Office of Government Relations helps to gather Episcopalians and others from both sides of the aisle for prayer, breakfast, and an occasional conversation with the presiding bishop. There's a group of women senators who meet regularly for, for prayer and for conversation across the aisle. And I'm told there are similar men's groups. Reconciliation is perhaps the deepest and fullest kind of transformation. And it's urgently needed in the world around us. In the capital, in every part of this nation represented there, 
and with all the other residents of this fragile earth, our island home. Your take on that here at St. Paul's is to shine as a light in the world to the glory of God, healing the brokenness, illuminating the darkness, reconciling the world to God's dream of peace. Be transformed and be a transforming blessing to the world. Now, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> Please. I was with you all the way until you said yoga service. <laughs> and the idea of St. Paul's holding yoga service and pouring up on the altar <laughs> and yoga pants <laughs> led me down the path of saying, at what point is the, the realm of possibilities of everything that you described and all the different outreach opportunities goes past a certain point. Is there some sort of objectiveness or just a cultural subjectiveness right then and there that says that's a little bit extreme, that's a little bit out of the ordinary. I don't think this is quite what we have in mind. Okay, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. It's not for everybody. Yoga is a... Uh, well, least... not yoga specifically, okay. but everything, everything <laughs> in general. That uh, invites people in and maybe an introduction to Episcopal worship. But Episcopal worship, even in this congregation, looks a lot more varied than it did 30 years ago. Um, we, we don't have to make a decision about a yoga mass. <laughs> but it's an example of other ways of engagement that people are trying. Thank you for speaking well, up about that. Well, again, it, it's not necessarily about yoga, is it? You know, somewhere they have skeet shooting mats, and somewhere else they have something else. You're like, oh, that's a little bit contradictory to what we're trying to do here. So is it something objective, or is it something very subjective right then and there within that culture that says, that's a little, not quite what we had in mind. It's not quite within the lines of the, the readings of the church. That it's a matter of discernment. I don't think there's a hard and fast answer, but it's a matter of discernment in community. And those are challenging conversations, always. Yes. Thank you. Following on that, what, what is the um, uh, role of a bishop in that in the decision of a parish to have, to do whatever, you know, to, to include their uh, <coughs> That's a great question. The bishop is technically the ordinary of a diocese, um, meaning <coughs> keeping the keeping the bounds in a in a in an appropriate place around liturgy. Different bishops decide those things quite differently. Um, as you're probably aware, Bishop Love in Albany has recently said that his clergy can't um, be involved in same-sex marriages. Um, the presiding bishop just last week um, said that's a decision that General Convention has made that they have to be available. You don't have to perform one, but they have to be available in the diocese. Um, there are limits um, in this church as to what bishops can say no to, and there are limits, presumably, they're not as well defined as to what bishops can say yes to. Um, it's again a matter of discernment in the local community. But I, I, my stance is that a bishop's job is to encourage congregations to be involved in the wider community and to be examining how that, that community might best be served. So it's always going to stretch what we've done in the past. It needs to. Please. So in your pathway of describing a transformed world, you first began with talking about transformed self. And I was really touched by that. So I was curious, you were talking about free will, and sometimes we don't have a choice of free will in that context. And I thought of Victor Frankl, and he said we always have a choice in how we choose to react. Could you dig a little deeper into that? Because I think the first step begins with us. Absolutely. Um, knowing that we are beloved of God, I think is the... <coughs> the core that gives us the, 
courage to respond in ways that are life-giving. I think that's what, what free will is meant to be about. Um, our, our psychological um, state, our uh, physical state, uh, the state of the world around us may limit us in the range of choices we consider. Um, some people would say that's not completely free will, but uh, it's reality. And we are freer when we claim that, in some sense. So could that be the role of the church, to create that space of acceptance and love that maybe somebody wasn't born into? Absolutely. That's ultimately what healing is about. Yes. As Episcopalians, we are not great evangelists. I know Bishop Curry has talked a lot about that. Do you have thoughts on how we can be better at bringing, I know we have this wonderful umbrella, but how can we begin to be better in your thoughts? Could you hear in the back? She's, she's asking about how Episcopalians can be better evangelists. That I don't think most of us are called to stand on the street corner and preach or harass people. Um, I'm I, that's what that is. <laughs> that's, 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 that's one understanding of evangelism, but I think it's a, it's a comical one. Um, building relationships with people is the deepest form of evangelism we can practice. Um, sharing with people our understanding that we know ourselves, beloved, and we believe you are as well. Uh, I think that's the core of what evangelism is about. Um, somebody, <clears throat> many people have said this over the years, that some of our best evangelical tools are weddings and funerals. Um, lo look at the royal wedding. <laughs> um, but being, offering to people who don't often come into our precincts, um, a vision of a God who is gracious and loving um, eager for relationship with you, who is not primarily about judging and telling you you're going to hell, um, that counter counteracts um, the message, some of the messages that go on in the world around us. Many ways, but building relationship. About 50 or 60 years ago, there was some movement of intercommunication with the Roman church. And then that seemed to have faltered over several issues that seem to divide the church. Is there anything going on now? Yes. There are, there are formal conversations, um, dialogues about theological issues. And in some ways, I think we're, we're in closer relationship with the Roman Catholics than we were 30 or 50 years ago. Um, we've agreed to some statements about Mary about justification, um, <clears throat> we're never going <clears> to, <throat> in our lifetimes, we're not going to see the two churches come into full communion, I don't believe. But we're working together in a variety of ways. We partner for all kinds of social service ministry in the wider community. We partner in terms of advocacy on things that we agree about. Um, and we continue to hold dialogues with each other. Next Sunday, I'm going to be in San Diego speaking to two gatherings of um, ecumenical bodies. It's the week of prayer for Christian unity this week. Um, we're going to observe that with, particularly with the Lutherans and Roman Catholics. Um, they're the organizers. They have a dialogue day every year. Um, it's important to keep the conversation open, to build the relationships. That's how reconciliation happens. Um, and I doubt that we will ever agree about anything. Everything. Um, <laughs> but this is don't all agree. <laughs> we, we can't hope for that to grow. <laughs> but yes, the work continues. Please join me in thanking you. Oh.